Thank you, Lord. Well, this is a, a first for me. I've done Sunday school lots of times, but I haven't done a Sunday morning thing before I, from the pulpit so that I remember, so I think I would have remembered. <laughs> so um, I'm really thankful that, that we're all here, and I've just been feeling the love of God just really strong. Um, I know that more than anything, He wants us all to leave here today knowing that we're loved. And that's the most important thing, and his presence is here. Um, so I, um, I got a, a bit of a download yesterday of what I felt God wanted me to share. And then as I read over it, I asked the Lord for scripture. Because lots of times while I'm writing, I'm quoting things from scripture, but not the, the total verse or the address or anything. So I asked the Lord for the addresses and um, printed them out. So um, I'm going to have Keith pass those out. And I didn't get them all. He gave me a lot of ideas about a lot of scripture, but I didn't have time to get them. Yeah, I didn't have time to get them all um, printed out. But uh, the ones I did, um, I think I'll have us, if you don't mind, even though it's Sunday morning service, it's not Sunday school, if you don't mind, I thought we could go around and everybody could read a verse until we get them all read. And then I wrote down the subject matter of the other one, so I'll probably uh, eventually look them all up. And so if you want to eventually have a copy of it, you can have it. And then I met with Stella outside, and she explained to me why she had to leave this morning. There's a birthday party with an elderly relative. But she said, ask Todd to um, record it so I can listen to it later. So I don't know if you always record Sunday morning. You do? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So Keith, uh, when you're done with that, I'll have you open us up in prayer, okay? Pray for your wife. Pray for my wife. Yeah. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to get together in your name. And Father, I thank you for my wife. I thank you for the message you've given her. I thank you for the anointing on her as a spokesman for God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Rob Emanuel. I was thinking about you this morning. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so Keith, I'll have you start out with the first verse, Second Corinthians five seventeen, and then you guys can just. Second uh... Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You could go next if you want, Todd. We're just going to read them through. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In a life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Matthew 6.31 Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. And as he go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, Cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. The sp oh, Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound.
Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. John 10.10 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they, have, that they may have it more abundantly. First John 3, 8. He who sin is of the devil, for the devil has seen from the beginning. For his purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. But when the helper comes, hmm? but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. I think that was John 15, 26. That's fine, yeah. We're in Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. I'm going to let you read number James 4 7. Okay. <laughs> 844. Okay, John 844. You are, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Okay. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Acts 10, 38, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Luke 9, 11, but when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Okay, and then we can go on to the next one, Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Let's see. Matthew 4.23. 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of disease, sickness, and all kinds of disease among the people. His, fame. his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought it to him all sick people who were afflicted with virus disease and torments and those who were demon possessed, e epilepsy and para paralysis. And he healed them. Great multitude followed him 
from Galilee and from the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Okay, so I'll try and get the rest of those eventually. Um, so I'm really very much in a process right now. Um, I've been meditating on these kinds of scriptures, the truth about being one with Christ, having the mind of Christ, uh, Vicki being dead and buried and risen uh, into a newness of life with Christ, Christ's spirit, being one with my spirit and meditating about healing and deliverance. And so I'm listening, listening, listening to teaching. So I have a lot of information I'm taking in right now. And so um, I just really pray that the Lord will help me settle into something I, I could share with you guys today. So it might be covering a lot of information, but I kind of look at it as seeds of the things that, that God wants us to meditate on in the Word because of the times and the days that we're living in and the move of God that's coming and the way that God wants us to be flowing in the love of God, in the generosity of God, in the compassion of God, um, being filled with Christ, being filled with this love that whoever God puts in front of us, whatever their need is, that we'll be able to help them because we'll understand who we are in Christ and we'll be able to do what Christ did when he walked the earth. So I'm at a very sensitive place with my walk with Christ right now. I feel like I'm in the middle of a really sensitive surgery and I feel really fragile and vulnerable and I have a low tolerance of things that usually don't bother me. Um, I'm more sensitive and cannot watch uh, violent movies. It's like it's too painful to my soul or something. And because uh, I think I just have myself like just wide open right now to the Lord. And so everything is so impactful. Um, Keith and I recently sub subscribed to Pure, Fla Pure Flix. So that's helping. <laughs> that's got good choices on there. Um, I used to watch a lot of Fox News, um, but now I just watch a little bit to kind of get a feel of what's going on, And but I, I can't tolerate too much negativity um, and all the, the mudslinging, the manipulation, all the corruptness in politics. I just don't want to dwell on that negativity right now. Um, I'm listening to teachings about being one with Christ, being hidden in Christ, healing and deliverance ministry. And God's doing a deep work, and I'm going through a transition. And it's like I've opened myself wide open, and I have to be very, very careful what I expose myself to, because if it's in a bad spirit, it, it really does feel like painful to my soul. Has anybody else ever kind of experienced that? It's just kind of interesting. Um, I really don't know if this will be a permanent thing or not. I do know that I want to be available for Christ to work in me and through me. And so if that means I need to cut some things out of my life, then that's a small price to pay. If I can be used to change someone's life and even perhaps their eternal destination. Um, when we're born again, our spirit becomes one with Christ. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. You usually hear that about marriage, but, you know, it's the same thing. We're one with Christ, just like we're one with our husband or our wife. And we become a new creation. And so it's interesting to me to think about how before I knew Christ, before I was born again, I was like a human being. What actually happened when I became born again? Did my DNA change? Did my cells and my makeup change in my body? I became superhuman. I became a new creature. And the old Vicky is dead and buried. And I'm raised in newness of life. So these are the things I'm dwelling on and wondering about. And God becomes our father and we become his child. We are a new creation. Our DNA is changed as we die and raise again in newness of life. We have our Father's DNA. We no longer are under the curse. We read that scripture about how we're not under the curse anymore. 
Uh, Father God has no generational curses to pass down to us. He has no sickness or disease to pass down to us. You know, my mom had some high blood pressure, diabetes, colitis. Uh, she had issues, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, her hands. And I just, uh, long ago, I, I just said, I rebuke all that in Jesus' name. I'm not having it. And I don't. She told me when I was 38 or 39, she says, now you have my hands, and you'll notice your knuckles are going to start getting a little sore, and then they're going to start swelling up, and your hands are going to start looking like mine. And I said, I rebuke that curse in Jesus' name. And she said, what? I said, I'm not having that. And, uh, you know, that was when I was 39. Now I'm 64. I have great hands. There's no pain, no, no deformity. We don't have to receive that just because our parents had it. Um, God is sinless, and he's perfectly healthy, and he's our father now. So we inherit from him. He has only blessings in life to pass down to us, like we uh, read in uh, John 10.10. 10. I don't know if we got to that one where, uh, how do you say it, Keith, can you quote it? Have abundant, have life and have it abundantly. That's what we get to inherit now. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Is he in the process of doing that, or did he already do it? It's done. He did complete that task. The devil is a defeated foe. The only time he can afflict us or opp oppress us is if he can trick us into believing he can. If we believe he is defeated and has no right to afflict us, we can submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. That's in James 4, 7. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. It is our job to enforce that. So we take ownership over our bodies, over our houses, over our animals, over our cars, over anything that our families, anything that we love and care about. We take authority and take ownership over it and we rebuke the devil. And we draw a bloodline between the devil and, and those things and we, we tell him he can't cross it. So we enforce what Jesus has already done. He has to be told to back off. He'll, he'll, uh, if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. You just have to say no. Um, Jesus went around doing good. He was always ready to help somebody with whatever their need was. Jesus had the fullness of Christ already. You know, we, we read about that, about how we're one with Christ and, and growing up into maturity and walking in the fullness of Christ. Well, he had that when he walked on earth because he is Christ. Um, when he died and rose again and went to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. Now we can go around doing good like Jesus did. God has designed it that way. That is what he wants us to do. When we see someone in need, he wants us to help that person. If that person needs to be healed, God wants us to do something about that. He says he is our helper. So we're not on our own. It's not Vicki that does it. Vicki's dead, but Christ lives in me. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is my helper. He can't help me do something if I don't do something. You know, if I'm not doing something, how can he help me do it? You know, I have to do something, and then he helps me. I asked for help this morning. <laughs> God wants us to heal the sick. It's, it is not us that heals. It is the Spirit of God working in us and through us that heals. So I was kind of picturing um, the movie of, of the Transformers, you know, the big, the big machines, and there's like a little person inside, and they're pulling the levers and stuff inside. Well, that's kind of a picture of what it's like to be clothed in Christ. Um, there's a little person inside this huge, powerful transformer. He has levers and buttons to operate this huge, powerful machine. Jesus works much like that. When we take the initiative to heal someone and command their body to be healed, Jesus backs us up and helps us when we 
believe he will. So I might reach out my hand and put my hand on somebody and, and say, be healed in Jesus' name. But it's Jesus backing me up and the Spirit of God going through me, through my hand, into that person. And I'm clothed in Christ. And he's the powerful one. But I'm inside pulling the lever and pushing the buttons and doing something. And then he is the powerful one that does the healing. If I believe that. When we believe, we can release the Spirit of God to transfer fr from us to the sick person. The Spirit of God fills that person with life, and all sickness and disease cannot exist with the powerful Spirit of God permeating through their body. You've probably heard the testimony about John G. Lake and how he really had a revelation about this. And he was, his body was alive with the Spirit of God, so much so that when they put the plague on his hand and they looked under the microscope, the plague died on his hand. It couldn't live there because he was so full of the life of the living God. And he had an amazing healing ministry. By the way, Jesus didn't pray to the Father to heal people. Jesus commanded. In the book of Mark, Jesus didn't pray. He commanded demons to come out. He commanded bodies to be healed. And he commanded the weather. Mark 1.25 But Jesus cut him short and spoke sharply. Hold your tongue and get out of him. He's talking to a demon. He commanded the demon to leave. Mark 1.41 Jesus was filled with pity for him and stretched out his hand and placed it on the leper saying, of course, I, I think he asked him, if you're willing, you can heal me. He says, of course, I want to be clean. He didn't say, Father, will you cleanse this leper? He just said, be clean. And he was clean. Mark 2, 8, 11, Jesus realized instantly what they were thinking and said to them, why must you argue like this in your minds? Which do you suppose is easier? To say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, pick up your bed and walk. But to prove to you that the Son of Man was full of authority to forgive sins on earth, I say to you, and here he spoke to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed and go home. And then they're healed. Mark 4:39. And he woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, hush now. Be still. The wind dropped and everything was very still. He even had that authority over the weather. So I think we can have that authority over the weather. Remember how all the Christians on the island prayed against Hurricane Lane? And Hurricane Lane suddenly became Hurricane Lame <laughs> and dissipated. As Jesus did, so do we. We command also. Jesus is our big brother. He showed us how to do it. Our spirit is one with Christ's spirit. He wants me to do what he did and even greater things. Jesus also wants us to meet people's needs in practical ways. When we see someone in need, we should be willing to meet that need and not just say, be well and walk away. I should no longer worry about what I shall eat or what I shall wear because my Father knows I have need of these things and He's already planning on meeting all my needs like a good and faithful Father does. So I can be His mouth, His hands, His feet and freely give because freely I've been given so freely I can give. Jesus is my elder brother and He exampled to me what to do and how to do it. He had compassion when He saw people suffering so He healed them. He came to set the captives free. He freed everyone that was oppressed by the devil. If I'm visiting with someone in Walmart and I see that they are sick and in need of healing, do I do nothing or do I ask them if they would like to be healed? Do I believe that if I command their body to be healed that the Spirit of God in me will flow through me into them and heal them or deliver them or whatever it is they need? If I see they need food, clothing, or money, do I say be well, or do I buy them a meal, give them a jacket, or give them some money? 
When we give to the least of these a cup of water, we are giving it to Christ. When we give, we are allowing the Spirit of God within us to minister to Jesus because when we care for a person, Jesus said, it's like doing it to him. Do we love him that much to do that? Do we worry if we will have enough for ourselves if we do that? Or do we believe that Jesus will provide for us if we give our money and things away? Are we selfish and always worried about ourselves? Or do we have compassion as we look at the circumstances in others' lives and ask ourselves, what can I do to help? This is one way we can go from orphan thinking to child of God thinking an orphan is always worried and fearful and thinking they're going to run out of everything but a child of God is um, secure because they're well taken care of. In knowing we belong to Christ, that our spirit is one with Christ's spirit and it is His will that we reach out and touch people's lives with His love and compassion, can we believe that our good and faithful Father will make sure that our needs are also met? We are entering a time of kingdom finances where God's going to be doing supernatural things with provision. Are we going to be willing to step out on a limb and give generously and invest in the kingdom of heaven? Or are we going to hoard and stash things away for ourselves and think of our own survival first? Being involved in the kingdom of God does not include any selfishness at all, but sacrificial love and giving as Jesus was the sacrificial lamb in giving. He gave no thought to himself, but he gave all. Um, so sacrificial love and giving, helping those that God brings across our path. Doing for them what we would like someone to do for us if we were in their shoes. That's loving others as we love ourselves. We, we think about their life, what they're going through. We think about if we were in that situation, what would we like someone to do for us? The main factor is love. When we love people, we are loving Jesus. When we bless people, we are blessing Jesus, and he does not take that lightly. Jesus helped anybody. It did not matter who they were, what their need was, how they had lived their lives, what sin they were in. Everyone that crossed his path was a candidate to receive love and healing from him. He died for every single one of us that ever lived. Every person is an object of his love, and that is how we should look at people, not judging them for their outward appearance. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God wants to save the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor. It is not his will that anyone should perish. What is the quickest way to win someone's heart and their trust? Take the time to see what their need is and meet it. When someone takes the time to love them and has no ulterior motive, just to love them and care for them freely, it moves people. I know a young man that was delivered from homosexuality because people he had grown up with around in his parents' church were there for him when he became very, very sick as an adult and he was unable to care for himself. And they rallied around him and took care of his every need and offered him love and comfort and absolutely changed him. He rededicated his life to Christ, met and married a wonderful woman, and they now have a daughter. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It is the gentleness of God that leads men to repentance. So as I continue in my journey with God, meditating on the truths of being one with Christ, being hidden in Christ, and the old man dying and allowing Christ to live in me and through me, I realize I am in metamorphosis. I'm in a cocoon. God is working in me and I have not come out the other side yet, but I know it's coming. As I meditate on these things, God keeps bringing to my attention things he has said to me over the last four decades and bringing new light to them, giving me more understanding of what he meant. When I come out of the other side of this, I expect I'll be very different. I am already noticing changes in me. God is challenging me with this verse. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He is challenging me to have better understanding what this means and then to have more surrender 
in allowing it to become real in my life. And just this morning, God spoke to me through the scripture. Um, it's, <clears throat> I believe it's in Luke. I didn't write that down, but it's when Jesus is, no, it's in Mark. Mark 2, 21 through 22. Nobody, he continued, sews a patch of unshrunken cloth onto an old coat. If he does, the new patch tears away from the old, and the whole is worse than ever. And nobody puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine bursts the skins, and wine is split, and the skins are ruined. No, new wine must go into new wineskins. So I get a revelation. I'm telling Keith about it on the way to church today, and he goes, well, I always knew that for years. <laughs> so, you know, we're all at different different process of, of our growth and our understanding. So this is the revelation I got. The old man is dead. I am a new creation. I am a new wineskin. God made my spirit one with Christ's spirit. The new wine being poured into the new wineskin. So when I got born again, Vicki died and I rose again in newness of life, a new creation. That vessel was able then to contain the Spirit of God because my spirit was becoming one with Christ's Spirit. So I had to become the new wineskin so I could hold the new wine, the Spirit of God. The new creation is complete, but in baby form at that point. It has everything. It has all its toes, fingers, arms, eyes, but it's a baby. But it's a new creature. It's not the old Vicky. It's a new creature. It's a little baby. But in baby form, it needs to mature. And there's a scripture about that in the Bible, and I didn't get that one looked at, but it's about maturing, coming into the fullness of Christ. That is where the renewing of my mind comes in, so that as my mind is renewed, and I have the mind of Christ, it comes into agreement with Christ's spirit within me, and when that happens, that is when the power gets turned on and I'll walk in the fullness of Christ doing what Christ did when he walked the earth and I will do even greater things. So that's why it's so important to meditate on the word and ask the Lord to give us more and more revelation. And if there's any mindsets that we have that are not correct, then we just pray, say, God, just expose everything that I believe that, that isn't your ways that isn't what you meant that isn't your truth knock them all down renew my mind so that i have the mind of christ that will be in agreement with the spirit of christ in me so that i can walk in the fullness of christ and god gets all the glory for as i step out it is not i who do it but christ in me the Spirit of God, I initiate it, I step out in faith, but it is Christ who backs me up and does the miracle, just like the transformer. I work the lever and release the Spirit of God, and Christ does the miracle and receives all the glory. And that's why it's important for us to stay hidden in Christ, because we don't want people looking to us. We don't want, we, we really want all these things that we do, we want to point to him and say, to God be the glory, because he's the one that's doing it. So that's, that's all I have for today. So I'll close this in prayer. Father God, we just um, thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you and praise you for um, the process that we're all in. And I pray, Father, that you give us more and more revelation, wisdom, understanding, love, power. Father, I just pray for each one of us that we will um, fulfill what you put us on this earth to do, Father God. I pray, Father, that as we spend time in your presence and look at you face to face, that we are changed into your image from glory to glory and become more like our Father. We want to have our Father's eyes. We want to have our Father's heart. We want to have our Father's love. We want to be just like you. And we do give you all the glory, and we do love you, and we thank you and praise you. 
In the name of Jesus, amen.